Okay, so you may know this week's guest from Heather's the Musical, Frozen the Musical, Wicked, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, Liv and Maddie on Disney Channel, and even Twitch, where he's built an army of daddies. This guest can truly do it all. Everyone welcome to Take a Bow, Ryan McCartan. What an intro. Oh, oh my gosh. My- no, you, I, this is everything. I, I admire your work and uh, to be able to talk to you about it is just a, such a joy. And I know a lot of people listening will, will definitely enjoy this episode. Well, I can't wait to be here and I'm so excited to chat. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. The way I usually like to start my episodes before we talk about your incredible career um, is I like to start from the very beginning and ask what inspired you to want to tell stories and want to become a performer and an actor? uh my sister uh we we don't we don't really know how or why but my sister allison kind of just came out of the womb singing and dancing (laughs) i was encouraged to take like a more traditional you know boy sports route and that really didn't work out for me a because i hated it but b because i got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at a young age and uh a lot of a lot of kids with diabetes can can handle um, you know, a, a athletic career for themselves. And that's fantastic for, for me, for whatever reason, it was just really hard on my body. And so I did not want to play sports anymore. And my parents said, okay, well, you have to do something. Hmm. Um, so my sister uh, was taking voice lessons uh, from a, a, a voice teacher in Minneapolis where we grew up. And, uh, you know, we didn't have a nanny or anything. So I just tagged along. And at the end of one of her voice lessons, the voice teacher, his name's John, uh, said to my mom, you know, does your son sing? And she said, Oh, I, I, I don't really think so. And he was like, well, let me just do five minutes with him. Oh. And what we didn't know is that he was sort of in cahoots with the artistic director of the history theater in St. Paul. And they were looking for a young boy for their Christmas show. Um, and this voice teacher like fully lied and said like <laughs> i found this boy he has he has so much experience yeah. like and and totally like like vouched for me after basically doing s- scales for 5 minutes oh, um word. so the short answer is i was inspired to tell stories by my sister the longer answer is i was accidentally inspired to tell stories because a professional lied on my behalf and got me into the business <laughs> that's incredible that's just like it was meant to be it was just like someone was pulling you in that's it's just crazy to me i like i go ahead what show was it it was it was a it was like an original piece it was called the christmas schooner and it was about like a ship that brought christmas trees to chicago in the dead of winter and you know (laughs) braved the ice and stuff oh my god that's iconic but i was like Uh, you know the son of the sailor yeah (laughs) there you go oh my god that's hilarious so you were kind of forced into it uh so you kind of started in theater then i guess and then you kind of went into the film and tv kind of world yeah yeah i uh, but for like a few random industrials or commercials uh while i was in minnesota you know going to middle and high school and stuff uh it was all theater all the time um i worked Professionally, I mean, you know, Minnesota is such an amazing minor market for theater, you know, regional Tony Awards, the the Children's Theater Company, Lord A Theater, uh, the Guthrie, um, you know, Peter Rothstein, Theater Latte Da, just so many amazing um, places where theater is is being made. And so I, I had the privilege to be able to work professionally as a kid uh from from 8 to 18 until I left Minnesota but also you know I did every single one of my competitive one acts at high school I did every single one of my high school musicals so truly all theater all the time and then that's uh, awesome everyone and their mother encouraged me to move to New York after I graduated from high school (laughs) and I I was afraid I mean I didn't I didn't have any connections out there I didn't know anyone out there and I so I, I knew that I didn't want to stay in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. So I kind of thought it was most likely either going to be New York or Los Angeles. Everyone was telling me to go to New York, but I didn't know anyone in New York. And I knew one person in LA. 
Wow. So I decided to come to Los Angeles and a year later, uh, I was on Disney Channel and then the year after that it was Heather's and it all kind of snowballed from there. Yeah. So so talk to me because that's basically, Live and Maddie was like your kind of big break then, I guess. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. So I'm curious from your perspective, um, how that whole kind of process and filming process was like when you have like one person playing two characters that you're supposed to be talking to. Like, what were some of those challenges that you had on set? I mean, honestly, like there there weren't any challenges. I mean, I like I wow. I, I can't speak for for Dove, who obviously, you know, being one person and playing two uh, is um a very heavy workload so mm -hmm. i think i think you know for her that was a a challenge um the the sort of like line that we always used which is true is that you know it it takes three girls to make one girl look like two girls <laughs> and uh and so shelby and emmy the two um sort of like photo doubles if you will <clears throat> sure they we it, it, you know they they weren't just like stand-ins they they were they were with us the whole time and so they uh sort of made a a, a career for themselves in in those few years of you know studying the mannerisms making sure that uh they were saying the lines in the same way standing in the same place all that kind of thing and you know with some terrifically brilliant editors and some great camera magic uh three girls made one girl look like two girls yeah so so like what was it you would actually like your scene partner would be like shelby or emmy like while dove was another person uh it dep yeah it, it, so if both of the twins were in a scene yeah and uh whichever whichever twin dove was playing uh pre predominantly or at least for initial coverage mm -hmm. the other twin would be played by either shelby or emmy and shelby always played maddie and emmy always played Liv. so that was another right. kind of um benefit in terms of sort of familiar familiarity both for them and for us sure. um, and so yeah so so you know dove would would be maddie emmy would be Liv. we would do the whole scene a billion times really ensure that we Wild. had dove's maddie coverage and then Dove would go back to hair and makeup and wardrobe, switch it all up. <laughs> Emmy and Shelby would switch out. Shelby would be Maddie. Dove would be Liv. And then we would do it all again. Yeah. I mean, my mind is in a pretzel just like thinking about that. So that's incredible that you guys were able to pull it off. Yeah. I mean, the what like the amount of like sort of organization that probably had to go on in Dove's brain is truly something that I can't <laughs> fathom. And and another person or group of people who really deserves a lot of credit is you know our our production staff and the first ad and the people who like actually had to keep track of sure, sure, what sure. we're shooting when we're shooting how to most efficiently get those things done i mean if you think about a, a wig change a makeup change and a wardrobe change that takes a lot of time so to kind of block shoot all of the maddie stuff and then switch that over to the live stuff I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was it, it was a production pretzel and the people who worked on it were consummate professionals. And I mean, I, like, because we also had, you know, Tenzing was still technically a yeah. minor. And so he would, you know, there's the, the rule about turning into a pumpkin where the kids have to go home. And so, you yes. know, regardless of, you know, Disney not wanting to pay us overtime, we were on a time crunch because we had kids on set. And I don't I don't recall us ever going over. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, I, that's I a mean, feat in itself. Yeah, the the people who worked on that show did a did a tremendous tremendous job making it. All yeah, work. and that's a testament to you as well. Like, I mean, you having to do that as like a scene partner and having a new scene partner in like one take and then a completely different one in another. Like, that's huge for all of you guys working on the show. So kudos to the the whole production team, the cast, everyone. It's insane. It truly takes a village, and I don't think people realize that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, whether you're talking about a twin show or a Marvel movie or right something small or something bigger, everything in between, I mean, it it takes an incredible amount of people to 
to make something like that happen. And when you're watching it, it, it feels so seamless and you don't think about the hours and hours and hours of time, not just that it takes for us to shoot it, but editing it, approving it, you know, Disney channel yeah. is notoriously um, uh, hawkish about, you know, the, the brand and what they are conveying and, you know, the family values and Disney channel plays in 90 million homes. I mean, right. <laughs> it's, it's a mammoth undertaking, not only to ensure that the art gets done, but that it gets done in the way that they like. And, totally. you know, we an episode never came out late you know we never there was one time that we couldn't finish an episode because of a force majeure like this crazy injury wow. that just like happened and there was like okay there's nothing we can do and we delayed for two weeks but then we like came back and double timed it and got it all out i mean it, it it's truly it's truly insane what people insane have to do seriously it happen. I know, because all we see is the final product. So we're right. like, oh, this is this looks easy. Like, this right. looks like something I can do. It's just, it's awesome. So then it's so funny that you say, like, okay, you were a little timid to, like, move to New York because you didn't know anyone. Because just after a year being in L.A., you were brought to New York. Like, you kind of had an opportunity in New York where you were in Heather's Off Broadway. Um, talk to me about that. Talk to me about being JD. Talk to me just about, like, I don't know like eight years later or however long it's been like it's still something that people talk about and it never made its way to broadway like it's crazy yeah uh, yeah okay so a lot of things to touch on there yeah like first of all and and this is just uh you know i i, I like this level of transparency for people who you know maybe want to get into the field like there, there's a difference between going to New York to doing to do a show and being brought to New York to do a show. And we were not brought to New York to do Heather's. The mm. the Heather's production, we the the initial production was in Los Angeles. We did a run for a couple of weekends at the Hudson Theater on Santa Monica Boulevard, a tiny theater. We broke fire codes every single day to fit <laughs> an audience in there. And uh, and New World Stages, I I forget, you know, sort of the the term of who was representing new world stage at the stages at the time, but a few people had come <clears throat> from new world to see if Heather's would be a good fit and decided to put not us, but to put Heather's mm -hmm. in their big theater in the basement. <laughs> and so what happened from there was the producer said to us, we would love to bring you all to New York, but, we can't if you want to do it you know we would love to have you but you'll have to secure your own travel you'll have to secure your own housing right. and you know we'll be paying you an off-broadway salary which isn't nothing but isn't much so you know to and and it was the the initial production was in los angeles most of us were la locals so yeah. a lot of us packed up our stuff and said this is an opportunity we can't miss and moved to new york and spent all of our money getting ourselves there Jeez. and then and again let's not be revisionist here and then we opened the show and two months later it closed i mean heather's flopped. yeah right so to answer your your question about you know what's it like eight years later i mean the idea that it's like been this phenomenal success for eight years is not necessarily true. It was sort of mm -hmm. objectively a failure, but then because of the brilliance of Larry O'Keefe, that amazing music. Yes. We sort of went viral. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the only thing that I could really compare it to is, is I think like kind of spring awakening book of Mormon, like these, these soundtracks oh. that sort of like went viral as yeah, internet virality was happening. Well, yeah, Beetlejuice was after us, but, mm -hmm. but you know, th this was, this was not something that we uh, were used to. And this is not something that, that really happened at that time. You know, mm. when you think of these albums that just got listened to over and over and over again, Rent and Wicked and what have you, it's because the shows were in extremely successful, you know, and then you have yeah. shows that don't do all that well in terms of their run, but they, 
get this whole other life because people really respond to the music. And that's what happened with Heather's. None of us were expecting that. And I think because so many of us remember the experience being so short lived, you know, I, I'm still close to so many people that I did Heather's with Barrett and Ellie and John and Evan and all of them. And, you know, sure. when we sit down and talk about it, we're sort of like, we, we don't really have any pers perspective about how that happened because it didn't happen with us. It happened after us. And now mm. everyone's sort of like, Oh, Heather's that's so dope. You were in this amazing thing. And I was like, I don't remember it that way. Right. But, right. but, but it has become this thing completely outside of our control and there's a there's a whole level of deliciousness that that brings to the table because you know it it's it's almost reflective of the original heather's movie you know it got this sort of cult following and people just wore it out despite how you know the mainstream maybe felt about it and here you know kind of mainstream new york theater goers decided you know with their pocketbooks that heathers was a failure but the the right. cult following said no it's not and now it's this huge definitive moment in the last decade of musical theater history that like everybody knows and talks about and that is just beyond me <laughs> right well it's interesting that like because you look at off-broadway shows and it's like not many of them have a cast album so it's kind of like right incredible that you all even record a cast you recorded a cast album in the well, first place and 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 there there's some prescience there that needs to you know be addressed and and my compliments to the producers of the show because you, you have to understand what your assets are and when larry mm -hmm. o'keefe writes the music you ha you have to record it you would be an idiot right. not to because by <laughs> the way larry did bat boy which was off Broadway and never transferred, but people love that music and thank God they recorded that album. So, yeah. you know, there, there, there is, there is sort of a formula of, uh, of uh, creating something that may appear as a failure into a success. And, you know, I think they, they did a really good job with licensing too, because, you know, every community theater yes. in high school is doing, Heathers and Heathers 101 and stuff like that. And then, you know, I think there's also sort of an elephant in the room when it comes to Heathers in America, which is that it's a musical and a movie about, you know, violence in schools, which in some places that can be campy, but in America, right. it's a little close to home. And so I think them bringing it to the West End and seeing our sort of Heathers family blossom over there, uh, you know, where they don't have an abject epidemic of, you know, school shootings. Um, mm -hmm. I think that makes a lot of sense too. So, you know, we, we definitely, we definitely pioneered a whole journey uh, completely on accident without any self-awareness that, yeah. that any of this would happen after the fact and to sort of be the, the, the spark that started this fire is like a, a truly humbling honor and something that, that, brings me joy every day because the fans love it and nothing makes me happier than that yeah exactly i mean that's what we're doing it for right we're right. just we're trying to make other we're trying to have an impact on other people's lives you know yeah. we're trying to give them something to look forward to and something to be happy about um it's it's awesome i i'm obsessed with the album i i just sang freeze your brain at a cabaret here in new york so no, it's just like yeah, yeah yeah i'm obsessed like it's so good um anyways so i'm curious because you were saying like you know you talked about being in la with disney channel and kind of them having um a picture of themselves and and of the the people that they have under contract and everything like what was that move to new york like was it something that like disney had to sign off of because you would be from away from la i mean you're playing jd which is kind of like a villain and diggy's this like heartbreaking heartbreaker like soft like lover guy like everyone falls in love with you know he's the jock and cutie <laughs> <laughs> so uh again you know just to to try to speak as like transparently and candidly as possible so that you know uh people can kind of see how these things work. The, mm -hmm. the, I had a, a very 
interesting accidental advantage by my role mm. with Liv and Maddie because I I was not a series regular. I was a recurring guest star. Sure. And the the semantics there when it comes to Disney Channel are very important because I, as a recurring guest star, am employed by the producers. Whereas okay. Joey Bragg, let's say, who played the brother, who's a series regular, he's under contract with Disney Channel. Ah. Uh. So they have all of their writers and all of the you know explicit text about um you know let's call it purity or what have you uh sure. that recurring guest stars who are employed by the production company not by disney channel itself are not beholden to and so i got all of the advantages of being regularly seen on a Disney Channel show because I didn't play in all of the episodes, but I played in like half of them. Mm -hmm. um, I got all of the advantages of regularly appearing on a Disney Channel show, but I never had to adhere to the strictures of the what's what's called the morality clause, where Disney Channel, you know, sort of mandates that their that their actors and actresses, you know, uphold this kind of virtuous visage while they're on the channel and you know we can i completely see how that makes sense from a business standpoint i think we have all seen how that mm -hmm. does not make sense from a personal standpoint we can get into the minutiae of that but i was able to sort of avoid that that sort of tricky hinge because i didn't have to ask disney channel's permission to do anything wow um you supplement that with my good fortune that the producer of Heather's was also the producer of Liv and Maddie. So oh. for me to say like, Hey, I still really want to be on the, on this show, but I'm going to be moving to New York. That wasn't a hard conversation because he was like, yeah, I know. And <laughs> so th there are some, epi you know, cause Diggy sort of gets into this, uh, uh, he sort of falls in love with traveling and is doing all of these study abroad things. And when Diggy is in the fictional land of Tundrabania, um, <laughs> We actually yes. shot those episodes. Diggy's footage that 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 Maddie sees from the phone. We shot those yeah. episodes in the stage manager's office at New World Stages in New York. No way. And Andy, the producer of Heather's and Liv and Maddie, would just sit in and watch them and call action and call <laughs> cut, and they would digitally render that into the the phone that you saw in the insert shot on Liv and Maddie, and that's sort of how we got away with it while I was in New York. That's awesome. True. That is insane. so cool. Yeah. Literally. See, it takes a village. You're literally yes. doing it with everyone. You're doing it in two different states. I mean, yeah. what is no, and, happening? And, like to be in a really good musical and to be on a television show at Come the same on. time. I mean, that was that was a dream. That was like one of the craziest years of my life. Yeah, I'm sure. And I'm sure it was like, I mean, I know that like it's a dream and like that's what we want to do. But I'm sure that that's also you know, tolling, because especially, oh, yeah. like, with, I mean, they're two very different characters, right? I mean, yeah. let's be real. And so, like, for when you're approaching, like, when you, you, you're handed the script and everything, like, from a performer and a storyteller's point of view, how are you, how quickly and how, what's the process of kind of going in and out of those two very different dynamics of kind of being a protagonist and an antagonist? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, 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 I, so I have two thoughts on this. The, there's, you know, you can never um, underestimate the power of like your habitual muscle memory. And mm -hmm. so, you know, not, not to be uh, uh, crass or to devalue this at all, but to be just completely frank, I, you know, I, I didn't really have to get into character for Diggy. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it's, it's uh, well within my wheelhouse to just kind of like, be a doofy lovable high school guy yeah. um to switch from doofy lovable high school guy to literal so soci sociopathic murderer that that was a, a big leap going back to diggy was never a problem but getting into jd was sometimes like woof how am i going to do this and that's where muscle memory really kicked in i mean the circumstances as silly as it sounds just like even putting on the costume clipping in the earring donning the trench coat 
you know, real. seeing the Heathers backstage, put getting my mic on, standing backstage, like all of those things, you know, they're they're primers. Yep. Um and uh, they sort of catalyze what's about to happen for you. And so, you know, I would always just really do everything that I could to kind of tether myself to those um, those kind of like circumstantial and environmental reminders about sort of what I'm here to do and who I am. And, uh, you know, that on top of just living through the context of the play, um, that that pretty much always got me into it. Um, but it, it wasn't incredibly taxing and, and, you know, I was also going through like a lot of personal stuff at that time. And it's, it's amazing because I think as, uh, you know, someone who loves entertainment, you know, were they to kind of study this phase of my career, they would be like, Oh my gosh, like, you know, this big Broadway, there's this big off Broadway show that turned into something huge, this Disney channel show that turned into something huge. Like, you know, this, this was like the, the luckiest, this was the best he was. That's probably the worst I ever was. I mean, it was, wow. it was like the, it was obviously so much amazing things were happening to me occupationally, but personally, emotionally, socially, like I was just a zombie at that time in my life. Um, and it's, you know, that's, that's a very interesting thing that I'm learning as I'm a little older and a little wiser. I mean, I'm still young. But, yes. <laughs> um, but, you know, to to be able to because there was a there was a phase in my life where when people wanted to talk about Liv and Maddie and Heather's, the two things that I'm arguably arguably best known for, mm -hmm. I would kind of shut down because they would re remind me of the the really hard times that I was going through at that point in my life. And just and to be to parse these things out. The. Interpersonal effect that they have on other people that can be separate from the interpersonal you know woes of the time and to 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 be able to separate those things and be able to celebrate them in spite of what was going on for me personally uh becomes easier and easier as time goes on um uh you know, but it's it's wild to like look back on some of those episodes, um, and just to remember where my head was at and how I was feeling at that time. I mean, because you know, the other thing, where I was twenty, like, yeah, I was really young, and yeah, and you're it's still very like new in the industry too. Very new, yeah. Well, new, new in this way, you know. I mean, yeah. at, at that point, I had been acting for twelve years, but. Right. You know, there's a big difference between acting. There's there's the show and there's the business. Yeah. And the show I've always known. Mm -hmm. But the business gets very heavy sometimes, yes. especially when you're young and you feel alone and or isolated. Uh, you know, you you don't get any tools to um to deal with any of these things i mean like i had a stalker when i was doing heathers i didn't know how right. to deal with that you know um yeah all of these sort of you know you suddenly people care about you mm -hmm. or want something from you but you don't have any resources to know right. how to adequately deal with that in a way that's appropriate because ultimately you know if someone really cares about the work that you're doing that's a compliment but if they cross a boundary and you freak out then you're the bad guy right you know? so th there was it was it was just a lot of that kind of stuff where i i just sort of felt like everything that i was doing was wrong yeah <laughs> and then i started therapy just, yeah yeah because you're just such in the public eye more and more you know yeah but anyways, we're going to move forward. We're going to move on to to hopefully better topics. I mean, I don't know. Okay, no. We'll talk to we'll talk about a better topic now, but I do want to well, talk about Well, and I about... also I just I just I I do want to say uh, again like I I have found that the most impactful thing that I can do is tell the truth. Right. I every time I just say honestly what was going on and how I was feeling, I am overwhelmingly met with 
people who are in receipt of that and who are glad to hear it. And so Mm -hmm. this is not, I just want to make sure that I'm clarifying for you and for our listeners, this is not a taboo topic. This is not a like, oh gosh, I don't want to talk about this. It, 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 it brings me great peace and clarity. And I think it brings other people great peace and clarity to, you know, hear about the humanity behind a person. Um, And uh, while these were challenging times, you know, they were ultimately in service of who I've now become and will continue to become. So, you know, they, they were, so fundamentally flawed, but ultimately perfect in terms of the, uh, the use that they had, these experiences had for me going forward. Right. And those are probably the best learning experiences. Absolutely. You know? Like you Absolutely. have to fall to, to learn, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. So totally understand. And that's what this is all about. Just highlighting people's careers, really letting people know that like people that are listening are just people that want to get into the industry, like, or big fans or something like that. And to really pull back the curtain and talk about what those experiences were like from a personal experience, because all you saw was us putting a smile on our faces and going out to perform. But there was a lot more going on. Um, Anyways, we're going to talk about, I want to talk to you about Wicked because that's, you made your Broadway debut in 2018. Talk to me about what it was like to make your Broadway debut. I mean, (sighs) did it feel like different? Because like you said, like you've been performing for so long that like when you got to the Gershwin Theater, I mean, obviously it's like a gigantic theater, but like, was there any added pressure did you feel? pressure um i mean it's such a terrible interview answer but it's yeah. a little bit indescribable yeah like, so let me hit a couple of points i mean yeah i don't the 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 pressure for me honestly i mean my two most ancient dreams in my entire life are to be on disney channel and to be on broadway yeah. and so the fact that i accomplished one at 20 and I accomplished another at 26 like both of those were like I remember the first time being like sitting down at the first table read and being like I'm on Disney Channel and like seeing the check on the mental checklist of like this is my most ancient dream and I've just done it and so that is exactly how I felt on Broadway but probably more so I mean I I discovered Disney Channel and wanted to be on it when I was 12 I discovered theater and wanted to be on Broadway when I was eight Mm -hmm. Um, so I think the pressure came from like, you make sure that you remember every second of this, you know, and you make sure that you inject every ounce of joy and gratitude and openness into this experience because, you 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 make your Broadway debut a single time, one time, right? And that's all you get. Um, and so there was I, I I put a lot of pressure on myself to like really, not like make the moment perfect, not any of that, but just feel the moment as it happened. Totally. Um, and you know, theater is theater is theater. So that experience was you know, something that I was used to, except I had never been put into a show before. Mm. So, you know, do learning the show alone in a room with two dance captains, completely separate from a cast. And then two (laughs) weeks later doing a put in with everyone. (laughs) And then the next day you're just in the show and you barely know anyone's first names and you've never seen them in costume. I mean, Kevin Chamberlain, uh, was on was right. on Wicked. He was my wizard, and he talked about on his debut how you know he did the put in. It went really well. Everyone was like, "You're great. You're going to be awesome in this." And so then it's his night to to do the wizard, and he goes out there and he fully goes up, fully forgets his lines because he turns around and he sees Elphaba Green for the first time because he's yes. never seen that before. Because it's you so rehearse funny. in a room by yourself. Yes. It's so funny. We actually had him on the podcast maybe like two months ago and he told us this he exact story. He told that story. Hysterical. Yes. So, I so, know. 
like go ahead. I, I I I didn't go up, thank God, but like a very similar experience where like suddenly I'm seeing all of these people in their wigs and their Aussie and costumes, and there's Jessica Vosk in her green, and there's the bubble dress and all of this stuff, and I'm just like, woof! I, like I I was not prepared for this. Yeah. Um. I remember seeing Wicked on. So there were two really cool moments from the night of my debut. I remember seeing Wicked on the road. It, it, where it, when it was on the road, it came to Minneapolis, sure. and that was the first time I saw it. I don't remember how old I was, but but young enough that while I thought it was really cool, I was kind of easily distracted, and I found myself very entranced by the dragon, the dragon mm. over the proscenium that flaps its yeah. wings anytime something magical happens. I just always remember myself feeling like very like, wow, that dragon is so cool. I mean, I was like twelve or something. <laughs> And the one moment that Fiero is fully alone on stage is right after As Long As You're Mine when Alpha believes in the cyclone hits. Mm. And again, anytime something magical happens in Wicked, the dragon is activated. Right. And so I have the sequence where I back up and I sort of look around and then I turn and I shut off my lantern and the entire stage goes black. And it's like, oh no, what happened to Fiero? And I remember on the night of my debut, stepping back with my lantern and looking up and seeing the dragon. Wow. And being like, girl, you are underneath the dragon. Like this dragon that you were obsessed with 14 years ago when this show came to Minneapolis is now above you because you're on stage doing this on Broadway. Yes. That was a what like truly a breathtaking moment. I like got off stage and I handed the lantern off to the props guy. My dresser gave me water and I was like, I need to sit down. <laughs> it was just, I mean, it was like so cool. I almost couldn't even stand it. Yeah. And then there was another moment, and I didn't know this, but you know, apparently on Broadway, places means like you still have 10 minutes. <laughs> so they called <laughs> yeah. so they called places for act two and it's you know it's my debut and it's my first broadway show and i'm fiero and i'm just trying my best and so i'm like i'm I'm on deck like 45 seconds after the call and there's no one there for like a billion years yeah. but it ended up being perfect because the only thing between me and the audience was the map and yeah. I just kind of stood on stage alone and like listened to the audience talking and was just, and like had sort of a private moment of like, this is your debut kid. Yeah. You did it. That's beautiful. What you worked of, for your whole life. Yes, absolutely. All of that wrapped up in a tiny little bow because <laughs> at 45 minutes before curtain. So 15 minutes before half hour, the yeah. dance captains had me come in just to run dancing through life one more time with my boots mm. on, just really make sure that everything's all good. Sure. And for the, for my put in, I had someone else's boots. And for my first show, <laughs> my boots were ready. So oh I put God. on my brand new slippery boots Went out on deck 15 minutes before the half hour call to my Broadway debut, climbed up the ladder. My boot slipped from the ladder rung. I fell no. off the ladder and landed on my ankle like this and was fully like, I just sprained my ankle. And the dance no. was like, nope, no, you're fine. You're good. And I kind of walked it off and I was, it really hurt, but I was like, okay, okay, no, I, I can do it. And like we iced it and we put me in a brace and I ended up doing it and then like for like i just kept doing the show on this busted ankle and then like four six weeks later something like that i was like out of the show for three weeks because i had like snapped a ligament or something oh my god but I, like it was and my debut was on 9 11 so like there was just there were so many things oh. happening but like that were so beautiful. I let, I, I started with the, cause you know, I just got kind of heavy a couple minutes ago though. So I started with the pretty stuff, right? but like there was <laughs> yeah. some, there was some wild stuff happening too. I, like I will never forget, like just looking up at the dance captain, Nikki and just like, I couldn't even, I was like, did this really just happen to me? 
Oh my god. I but I, I, I got, I mean, I got through it. it. It all worked out and, you know, then I was out later, but like, at least I didn't miss my debut. So, you know, that right. was the most important thing. It, I mean, it was just, it was a wild night. And my sister was there. My sister was in the audience. Oh. So like, there was so much imperfect about it, but there was so much that was absolutely perfect about it. And sure. I mean, you know, such is life, I suppose. But it, Such uh, is life. The process, the show, it was all wild. We love live theater. Yes. We just oh my love God. it. It's Anything just can so happen good. truly. It's, yeah. And the stories, the stories, yeah. that's what we're here for. Yeah. Um, well, I, I just want to ask you really quickly because I want to let you go, but I, I just need to talk to you about Frozen. Um, it's so cool that you kind of, you know, you got your big break on Disney Channel and now you're going to play uh disney prince on Mm -hmm. broadway and on tour um and all the things and i know that frozen and your runs in both productions were wild and Mm -hmm. got cut short Mm -hmm. um i'd love to hear to hear stories from frozen and and you had this beautiful message on instagram that you posted about you know both of your runs being cut short Mm -hmm. and i'd love for you to to touch and elaborate on that as well yeah it would be my pleasure i mean so yeah, first of all, you touched on something that's just so incredibly true. You know, D- Disney is a is a very you know thick fiber woven through my particular tapestry, and I've 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 worked for a lot of arms of that or a lot of tentacles of that octopus. As a matter of fact, you know, I've I've had my music play on Radio Disney. I've worked for Disney Channel. I actually played Flynn Rider at Disneyland, and I've oh also worked with Disney Theatrical Group. Uh, doing the the broadway show frozen and the tour and so like like you know disney has really been buttering my bread as a matter of fact i actually just i did a tiktok deal with them in december too to promote west side story so like i like they i love me some disney and obviously like they are not without their problems what corporation is but you know they they have been very good to me. And what I'll definitely say is Disney theatrical group, Disney on Broadway feels a lot more like the Disney tentacle of the Broadway octopus than the Broadway Mm -hmm. tentacle of the Disney octopus. If that makes sense. Yeah. It's, you know, Disney sort of has this like cohesive brand and they're very professional and we have like a million lawyers and then you go and you work on, on for Disney on Broadway. And it's very much like we are governed by theater. Mm -hmm. Like we are theater people. We are making theater. We have a legacy of changing the way theater is made on Broadway. I mean, you just look at the Lion King or you look at the nineties with beauty and the beast and Lion King alone, you know, not to mention Aida and Aladdin and just all of the things that they've done. Literally. Um, and so, you know, that like l- that legacy and understanding of what theater is shines through a heck of a lot more than like we are Disney, mm-hmm. um, which is, is a compliment. I, I think that, I think that the, the group of people that I have worked for both in frozen on Broadway and the tour, I mean, just, exceptional experiences and i was treated so incredibly well um i i have a bottomless well of love for mackenzie kurtz sierra renee and ellen marlowe the the three people who joined the company with me retect the show for this new generation of frozen to just do it for two three weeks to have it shut down because of the pandemic and then subsequently closed permanently. And again, I mean, in the same way that you can sprain your ankle on the night of your Broadway debut, it's like, I'm, my heart is, is, was broken that frozen closed, but retrospectively, again, you know, our hardships teach us profound lessons. I feel so light on my feet now because I truly and prepared for everything and expect nothing not in a yeah. not in like a weird not in like a bad way in like a very beautiful way I'm, i i feel that i feel that you know joining this incredible opportunity just to have it ripped away by a global pandemic i mean something that like truly no one had any 
control over there was there was absolutely no way of knowing that that was going to happen you know it it right. actually sort of fundamentally changed the way that i approached my career and so the tour was a really good example of that and the fact that the fates aligned that Mackenzie was able to join the tour at the same time that i was and we were able to sort of have our individual our individual closure happen together was wow. incredible but who we were together on stage was different than when we did it on broadway and i think the biggest difference was a a, a, a more profound and more ethereal sense of presence that Mackenzie and I, and of course, everyone who has done theater post pandemic are now fundamentally aware that you had best be dropped in and present to every moment in every scene because COVID could shut us down at intermission. Right. Let alone, Amen. you know, after the show, let alone after this week. Um, and so, you know, again, while of course I would prefer that a global pandemic didn't happen because it did <laughs> the, the lessons that I learned and, and the, the, the sort of emotional equipment that I was able to utilize as a consequence, you know, not in spite of the bad thing that happened, but because of the bad thing that happened, uh, that was like just a, a gorgeous and revealing moment of, of growth. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. What else can I say? I. I. I think. I think Mackenzie is a force. I. I can't even. Be, I can't. I can't believe what I had to do to get into the tour because we had a week. So really? I like what what one. Well, actually, it was it was really six days, but it was really more like five. And oh our God. and our put in was the same day as our opening. So our put in was Thursday afternoon and then we had dinner and then we were on. Yeah. And unreal. like what I had to do to get read after not having done theater for two years because of the pandemic, yeah. I was so unconditioned. Like what I had to do to get ready for that was insane, but I'm Hans, honey. Right. He doesn't do that much compared to Anna. So what right. Mackenzie had to do genuinely inhuman i i do not understand it that that woman is going to unfathomable places oh um that's so sweet so i have a question yeah as go ahead. far as like so i know you mentioned doing you know you guys reimagined this whole production that frozen was going to be on broadway mm -hmm. was it that reimagined version on tour or was it the original kind of version that they originally had Yes. Um, <laughs> do you? Yes, to both of them. So, <laughs> okay, great. So the 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 sort of like reimagined, retect version that we did on Broadway was a synthesis of our new ideas and all of the ingenuity that was coming from the tour cast, who ah. was rehearsing and mounting their show around that time. Uh, however, the tour cast is. Uh, two or three people smaller. Um, and there was another sort of rehearsal process post pandemic when the tour reopened. And so the, the sort of the, the amalgamation of what frozen is, is a storied lineage of many people and many companies and many people's, you know, creative uh, uh, input, which it, in one sense is a beautiful thing for us. That was intense because we were relying on muscle memory for a show that we never truly knew from two years ago to get us into a show that was similar enough <laughs> to make us think we could rely on muscle memory, but actually yeah. was not the same. So if, if we did rely on our muscle memory, it was wrong. Yeah. Which was intense. But, but the, the company on tour, uh, and yeah, I, I, I put this in, in the Instagram post that you, um, mentioned before. Right. 
uh, I, I regard these people with truly the highest esteem. I mean, the, the, mm. the, the way that they cared for us, the space that they gave us, uh, the information that they knew we needed and shared with us. Uh, not only are they amazing people off the stage, but on the stage, you know, what we had to do would have been impossible without their support. Absolutely. Um, and I, I, I did. I mean, I truly thought as far as my Frozen legacy was concerned that the hardest thing I would have to do would be get over the fact that I didn't get to finish it the first time. But it yeah. was profoundly more difficult to have to say goodbye to it the second time. Wow. Um, and I think, and I think, go ahead. Is it because that, like, I know the first time it was just so short. It Was it kind of like that kind of thing? Or was it because, like, just like you got to grow with it and you really got to understand and the pand pandemic put things into perspective and you were just so sad to, like, say goodbye to live theater? I think it's that. I, th I think, I think it's, it's, more closely aligned with the second thing that you said. And, you know, okay. yeah. So, so the, my last weekend on tour, I had a sore throat when I woke up. So my closing show mm -hmm. would have been Saturday night or excuse me, Sunday night. I woke up Saturday morning with a sore throat and I knew for a fact, like if I sleep all day, I could probably kick this, but I can't sing through this. And so uh... I, I called out Saturday morning, but because COVID is still here, there is a very strict protocol chain. And that protocol chain does not begin if you get a positive test. It begins if you report symptoms. Mm. So I never had COVID, but because I reported a symptom of COVID. No way. I had to be out until they could get a positive test certified by a lab. And they couldn't get that in time for me to perform my last show on Sunday night. Wow. So a technicality ended up cheating me out of my second closing night. I but agree. what I'll say, because as you so adequately, or uh, so um, adeptly put, the, because of the perspective that the pandemic offered me, and because of the onstage presence that mm -hmm. I talked about before, while I had no idea that Friday night was my final show, I remember everything about it. Wow. That's very different than the Wednesday night two yeah. years ago. I remember nothing about my closing show on Broadway. A, because I had no wow. idea it was going to be my closing show, but B, because I didn't care to. Because I didn't know that anything could be taken away at any time. Now that I do... I'm I'm present for everything. And that. yeah. And I didn't know Friday would be my closing show, but I remember everything about it because I cared to because I because subconsciously or consciously I knew anything can happen at any time and we can't take advantage of these moments. We can't take them for granted. Um Right. So it was it sucked that I didn't get to do my technical last show. But I still got my closure, and it was still very beautiful. And um, that cast is just filled with phenomenal people. And uh, uh, it's only been like two weeks now, but I, I miss them terribly all the same. Oh, my goodness. That is so sweet. I know there's something about a touring cast i mean obviously like your days off are still spent with them because you have to like travel and everything so you literally don't get a second away from them and i just think that like a touring cast makes it's it's a family it, it's like actually a family because like there's something about going home after a show going to a hotel or an airbnb that you're rooming with someone in the cast where when you're on broadway you're just going home after the show to the subway and just like kind of living your life and it's like everything's forgotten and so like the cast the touring cast just come together so beautifully and i think like everyone i talk to on here and even from my personal experience like everyone has such a special moment and a special place in their heart for for their company on the tour it's incredible yeah well and then you subsidize that with the fact that all of those things that you say are so incredibly true and 
they are bound by the collective trauma of the pandemic of right. starting the show, then ending the show, then starting it again. And then, you know, I mean, they, they were running in Chicago when Omicron happened, you know, the, the, the good things bind us together. Obviously, I think most powerfully, but trauma binds us together too. And, Absolutely. and so all of those things that you say are so true about, about sort of the, the, fraternity of the tour but yeah but you compound that with everything that they went through and that we all went through with the pandemic and those those um those links between everyone become all the more rigid become all the more strong uh and to be welcomed into that energy is, is really palpable, really overwhelming and a beautiful thing. Yeah. That's so beautifully said. And so true. I, yeah. I love it all. And I think that's a beautiful place to end. Um, Ryan, thank you for so much of your wisdom and, and just talking to me about your, your career. I mean, we didn't even get through all of it. I, we didn't even talk about Rocky horror or anything like it's Rocky horror is easy. Just, I mean, best thing I ever did like hands down perfect experience best that one's thing easy. yeah absolutely oh my word is it like the musical like movie like what like why was it the best thing uh, the 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 people the crew the producers having kenny ortega wow. direct it, having tim curry be in it i mean everyone in the cast was brilliant in front of the lens but also behind the scenes just great people we were all in toronto we shot in a literal castle we did night shoots so literally like we would be up you know from <laughs> 6 p.m to 6 a.m and then we would all like go out afterwards for breakfast and then sleep all day we were, so we were all just like vampires living in toronto shooting this beloved piece of cinema history in gold makeup and corsets and like it's just it was it was an absolute riot. It was so much fun. It's one of my favorite movies. It's one of my favorite roles. It's one of my you favorite directors. What's that? You look absolutely fierce in the movie. You know, you're not wrong about that. <laughs> I, I agree with you. And that also is why it was one of my favorite. Th it's my favorite thing I've ever worked on because I, like the looks. Yes. Of it all. It was everything. Oh my god. And that seriously, that that has Laverne Cox. Oh my god. Justice, Reeve Carney. I mean yes. just incredible. Uh that's awesome. Well, again, this is this is a blast, and I could literally talk to you all day. For everyone listening, I mean, I'm sure they follow you already, but please drop your Instagram handle and then of course your Twitch your Twitch uh stream or stream link or whatever yeah. you drop. I don't even know. <laughs> I, I'm I'm all over the place. Instagram, I'm M C C A R Y A, which was my high school username to check my grades because someone already <laughs> stole Ryan McCartan. So whoever is Ryan McCartan on Instagram, good for you, I guess. Right. Uh, my my partner and I have a YouTube channel. It's just called Sam and Ryan. You can check that out. We talk about theater stuff all the time. And then yeah, I'm on Twitch as well. That's just Ryan underscore McCartan. If you like video games and if you like me making an absolute fool out of myself, please come watch. We have a lot of fun on there. That community is is just stellar. Yeah, become a daddy. I love it. Become a daddy. <laughs> I love that. I It's so iconic. It's perfect. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much again. It was so great to meet you. And just Pleasure's online. thank you for coming on. Seriously. It was the candidness of like the conversation and everything that you were able to add and talk about was just really brilliant. And I think that a lot of people will, will enjoy this and get a lot out of it. So thank you. Thank you. It means a lot to me.